So we, we would like to uh, pray for our children as they go back, uh, back to the to the nursery and also for Children's Church. So will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for our children. Uh, we do want to pray, I forgot to pray for Ruth. We want to lift up Ruth to you and pray for Kip and Hunter. Pray for them today and we pray especially for Ruth's recovery. Lord, have your hand upon her. We thank you for uh, moms and dads and taking care of our children and watching out. And uh, we ask you might just really bless them. And Lord, we pray also for, uh, we want to pray for this family, the Carpenter family, Lord. And uh, uh, we just ask help for them as they lost uh, much of their stuff in this fire, a whole bunch of stuff in this fire. So Lord, we just pray that you might meet their needs and just be with them. Uh, help them finish their house, help them to be able to do the things that they need to do. And Lord, we just pray for your, your hand upon them. And we pray uh, through this, Lord, that they might come to know you. We don't know where they are spiritually, but we just lay them at your feet and ask that you might just really work in their hearts and lives. We thank you, Lord, for uh, just answered prayer. And we have lots of examples of that today here in our, in our body. We just pray, we appreciate you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So children are dismissed for uh, the junior church and Sunday school if you haven't gone yet. Yeah, do you need it? No, I think I left them in the back. Sorry, you couldn't. You don't have them. They're in. They're on my. They're in my desk. You want to go? You want me to? You, Jim Jim Hudkins and I were sharing glasses this morning. So, if you would turn in your Bibles today to uh, Psalms one hundred and three, one hundred and three, that would be awesome. This is a, a really good psalm. You know, there's so many good psalms. It's hard to pick, to uh, obviously pick and choose. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you connect with a psalm that you really like. And um, so this is Psalms 103. I love this because he, he quotes uh, David uh, quotes from uh, from the Pentateuch from uh, from Exodus. And so I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, and if you, you know, it'd be great, maybe if we stood this morning, I know you just sat down, but if you could stand with us again, that would be great as I read the word. Just a great passage here. Uh, I said uh, this is, uh, I'm beginning to Psalms 103, verse 1. I'm, I'm uh, reading from the New International Version. It says, uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed, he made known his way to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like, flower, like, like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant 
and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise to the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who did his bidding, who obey his word. Praise to the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. May God add his blessing to his precious word this morning. You may be seated. It's a great passage. You might spend some time this week looking at that. You know, as we look forward to Easter, we want to, get, we want to prepare our hearts and minds in preparation for this. I encourage you to read the gospel accounts. You know, uh, we're, I'm going to talk just briefly about, you know, Psalms 22. Psalms 22 is a great description of Jesus on the cross. You know, you think about that. It's just like, there are so many, Isaiah 53, there's some great passages in your devotions where you can think about Jesus uh, shedding his blood on our behalf and, uh, and, uh, and paying for our sin. And so it's a great opportunity for us this time of year to start thinking about what Jesus has done for him and praise him. You know, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, for his great goodness and grace and mercy to us today. So will you, will you pray with me today? I would ask you to, to do that as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Nothing happens, O Lord, apart from your Holy Spirit. We know that you are here. We know that you uh, want to work in our hearts and lives, Lord. May we be receptive to your, to the, to your word to you, as you speak into our hearts, Lord. We pray that you might teach us and guide us. We pray for your outpouring of your spirit on us today. We ask, Lord, that you might fill us with, with, uh, with your Holy Spirit, with yourself. Lord, may you work a work in our lives uh, if there's resistance because of sin in our hearts or maybe resistance because of pride, who knows? There could be a lot of different resisting things in our life. Lord, we want to give those up to you. We want to just lay them, we lay them at your feet and just say, Lord, I've been resisting this. I've been stopping you from working. And Lord, we just want, to, we just want you to, to take that out of the way, Lord. Uh, heal us, Lord. Uh, Lord, we are, we, are, we are broken this morning. We are broken. But Lord, we are blessed because you're, you're, that you, you live in our hearts. Jesus is our Savior, and our Father loves us so much. So we just appreciate you, and we ask your, your blessing upon our time today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, so you know, so we, uh, we, you know, we went to this. Uh, it was nice. Alec Rollins is a pastor there at Westgate. He came over. Uh, when Alex Roland was a little boy, I think he was about nine when he started, and then is and 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 grew up in his teenage years. Uh, his father was a pastor in South Africa, and you don't know Alec Rollins. I didn't know him very well. He came over and met with our pastors group. You know, our pastors group has been praying uh, for uh, about fourteen, maybe fifteen years now for revival in this area for transformation in uh, in. Uh, Deer Park, Chowila, uh, Peaceful Valley, Highway 2, all the folks down that way. We, we had, uh, last week we went to um, uh, Open Door Bible. Uh, just uh, you turn there right at Miller's One Stop, and it's, a little, it's not a little church. It's a nice, nice church down the way there in Elk. And just blessed, you know, that we have a number of pastors that we get together with and we pray together. But our prayers always, every time we pray, is, Lord, pour out your spirit on this place. May there be a revival here. And so Alex uh, Rollins, when he was a little boy, his dad was just about ready to give up on the ministry. He had, his mom and his dad had gone out to, they'd gone on retreats. They'd done all sorts of things. But they, were, they had a small, little small church in South Africa. I think it was Durham or Durham or something place. And I have no idea. I've never, I've never even really looked at it map of South Africa, but in this little, this little church. Anyway, so they were, they were, they, they were really discouraged. And one, one morning, uh, you know, uh, he was complaining to the Lord and the Lord said to him, just, just stop, stop complaining. Just get up and start praying for God to work. And, uh, and so all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just poured out on this little church. There was only like, he said there was probably 10 people there, maybe 20 people there. But all of a sudden, the, the church just changed. People started confessing sin, and people started to um, 
people that would that been feuding with each other, contestants, and you know, and of uh, uh, to each other. And he said uh, it was really funny. He talked about that. And so, so the so the next so the next Sunday they go to church, and um, and there's 200 people there at this little church, and and uh, and the, and uh, they they look to look at each other. This is mom and dad, and say, well, there was a maybe there was a fire there or something happened. No, there was a fire, all right? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was being poured out on that place, and people started coming. He said that that, that, uh, uh, that visit of God in that little church lasted for like 12 or 13 years, poured out there. And so, you know, so that's been our prayer. You know, we, uh, we, our group kind of came together with the transformation videos. God was doing work in Columbia, uh, in Columbia South America, uh, he, he was doing work in other places around the world, and, and we've been praying that God would do a work here. That's our prayer. And so it was great to come together, because God is working, you know. Sometimes we don't know it in this country. You, would, you know, of course, the media doesn't tell anything about what God does. You know, the, the God doesn't exist in the media's mind, especially social media. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you can obviously on Facebook, you'll pick up things from different people, but it's like, okay. So anyway, so, but God is working. You know, we don't we don't realize it, but he is, and so I, so I'm just so anyway. This is his heart. I remember Sherwood Word, and you probably don't know who Sherwood. Word, I don't know. I never met him, but he was the, he used to write for uh, Billy Graham. He wrote the um, oh the their paper that they that they put out. I can't remember the name of the paper, but he, what's that? Thank you, yeah, for de decision. See, that's when you get older, people have to fill in your sentences for you. Now, Jennifer does that all for me. She'll fill it in, okay? And I'll help her do that too sometimes, but, you know, fill in the words. For decision Magazine. But anyway, he said he was involved in a, in a um, um, where God was pouring out his Holy Spirit, a revival place, and this was in Vietnam of all places, in the mountains of Vietnam. And he said afterwards, he said, when I came back to the United States, I, didn't ever, I never wanted to play church again. I wanted to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I wanted to experience what God was doing in a mighty way. You know, and sometimes we play church. We, you know, we, and there's, and understand, we understand that. We, you know, we, we are, we, we, uh, but it's the Holy Spirit that determines this, that makes things happen. You know, he, he pours it out on us. And so, but, you know, we can pray for that. We can seek that. And he blesses us, you know, you know, all the time. So, but I just think, what a great thing. But Sherwood Word said, you know, he actually, in his book, it's interesting, he says that, remember I talked about the, the, the you know, the, uh, the heavens, you know, 200,000 galaxies of stars. And he says there's an actual sound that the heavens transmit, that God transmits. If, and he said that people, that we can't hear it because we have so many distractions. We have our headphones on, we listen to the TV set. You know, that's why he says, just, just be still sometimes and listen to God. So Elijah heard the still, small voice of God. You know, and so we get, we get, we get so busy, you know, and we're so distracted. And he said there's actually a sound that the creation emits Psalms 19, we talked about that last week, that, he, that the, the creation admits that we, we should be able to hear from God. He speaks to us. So anyway, so I just encourage you, you know, as, as you're thinking about, you know, just, you know, don't be afraid, Lord, you know, you know send your spirit, you know. I, I love it when in Luke it says that he, you know, he says a good father, even a good, a good uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, Earthly, uh, a, a human father gives good gifts to their children. How much more does God want to give us his Holy Spirit? You know, he desires to give that to us. He wants to. And so we can, we can work on that. Anyway, so I, I just want to talk a little bit this morning about, this is Psalms 103. Read it to you. I said within the Psalms, within the Psalms, and there's many, and there's many verses, by the way, in the, in the book of Psalms, is the heart of the gospel. The gospel is there for us. The gospel is there. God shares his heart with us, and that is really the gospel heart. I, you know, I, I love this. I think I, got, I, think I stole it from uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, but if you look on the second page, on your back page, I want to just talk to you about the gospel this morning, right? On the back page, this is my last point. 
I want to start with that, and just because it, to me it just really impressed me when I read it, and I stole it from I think Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, he has a you know I know, uh, and and I've talked about Martin Lloyd Jones. He was a great preacher in England. He passed away in about 1980. Uh, he had uh, he has an eight volume eight volume. Not, this is just who he is. He had an eight volume set on the book the book of Ephesians. He has like a 12-volume set on the book of Romans. It took him uh, 12 years to preach through the book of Romans. Now, so I know sometimes you guys think I get hooked up on something too long. You know, that's, that happens, you know. But he preached for 12 years on the book of Romans. And he has like 12 volumes in his, in his commentary. So anyway, I think this is from his, from his book. But this is what he, I just like this thought. This is a tremendous thought when you think about this. The gospel, this is his gift to you. The gospel is entirely God's. The righteousness of God is provided by God. God did it for you. It is a righteousness that is prepared by God. It is a righteousness that is made available by God. Therefore, the gospel is entirely God's. He gives it to you. Your righteousness never comes from you. Now, there is personal righteousness, and as you grow in grace, we call it sanctification. That happens. But when you talk about salvation, Jesus Christ takes his righteousness and places it in your account, in your life. Otherwise, you would be lost this morning. You would be lost if he didn't give you his righteousness. That's what happened to Abraham, right? God accounted him righteous. And gave him, God gave him uh, God's righteousness, right? Because he believed God. He had faith in God. And God gives us his righteousness. But all of it's from him. It's his idea. He thought it up. He sent Jesus to die. It was his son that died on the cross for you and me. It's all God made it available to you. The gospel. I said the gospel is God's gospel. Gospel means good news. Isn't it great news that Jesus loves you? Nobody loved you. Nobody loves you more than Jesus does. You want that verse? And I just read it to you in Psalms 103. He says, let me read it to you again. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high is it? 200,000 million galaxies, right? And you could travel all your life at the speed of light, and you still can't get across one of them. 200,000. That's how much love God has for you this morning. Don't ever say nobody loves you today, because God does. He sent his own son to die for you. He sent himself to die for you. The good news of the gospel it is God himself who provides, this is, I'm looking at, the, I'm on the back page, this is 4B. It is God himself who provides this way of salvation. It is God who provides everything that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God who sent him. It is God who gave him this task. Right? Remember he said, I must go to the cross. I, I'm going to go, up. they're going to kill me. They're going to murder me. You know, he said, the night he took the cup. This is, this is my blood which I've shed for you. For you, right? The entire action is from God. It is God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I said the law and the prophets, the Old Testament pointed to the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And I gave you a bunch of verses. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's the reality of salvation. You believe that Jesus loves you. You believe that Jesus died for you. And when you believe that and have faith in that, that's what salvation is. We identify with his death. We identify with the blood he shed for us. And we believe that, and God credits his righteousness to us. And You can read that in Romans 4, Romans 3. Acts talks about it. So I said, this is now, you can back to the front page. Sorry to end with the ending. Start, to, I mean, start with the ending. I said, Moses asked the Lord for revelation of his glory. Remember he says, he told, Moses said to God, I, it's interesting, all this stuff was going on with Israel, and what does Moses want to do? He says, Lord, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. And he says, well, if, 
Moses, and of course, Moses had already seen a lot of his glory. Remember, his face shone, and he had to put a veil over it. People say, "Well, we can't hardly look at you, Moses. You got the, you know, you know the the glory of God shining out of your face." But he says, "I really want to see your glory." He says, "If you saw my full glory, you would die." That's where a lot of people talk about in the Old Testament. Well, I think I saw God. I, that means I'm going to die. Well, no, you you saw you saw a part of God, but you never really saw the glory of God. Because if you did see it, you would die. You couldn't handle it. Physically, you couldn't handle it. So he puts Moses in this, this little, you know, we talk about the song, Cleft of the Rock. He walks by. But the thing that really impresses me is what he says. You know, and I've talked about this before. You know, it's one of those things. It's like, if God was going to tell you something this morning, if God was going to tell you something about himself, what do you think it would be? Well, if I was going to tell you something about it, it wouldn't be probably nothing like this, not what God told you. I mean, I'm just thinking about it. If you're going to tell somebody about yourself, sometimes we will tell us something about yourself. What, what was the most important thing that God wanted them to know? You know, he wasn't allowed to see his face, but he revealed his glory to Moses for the revelation of his name. And this is what he said. This is point one. When God reveals his heart to man, he tells us about himself. He says, the Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And, and what I want you to understand is God wanted us to know that he was a loving, forgiving God. He is a forgiving God. He forgives us our sin. And this morning, more than anything else, we need forgiveness. We need to know that God forgives us for our sin and that he really does love us, right? Because he says, you know, the verse right after he says, for as high, this is 103, Psalms 103, 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. What You'd ask the question, what, how, how can you show your love to me, God? How, how would you do that? Well, I show my love by sending my son to die for you. I sent my love to you to, I, so that I could forgive you. I sent my son to you. So the greatest thing he could possibly do, he does for us. He says, I love you. I'm, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. And he does it through Jesus. And then he says in that next verse, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, he's not talking about starting here and going to Seattle we drove to Seattle this week, and we drove back, of course. There's about a six-hour drive. And then keep on going, you know, go to the Wine Islands and keep on going and go clear. You know, uh, you know that's what, you know, James Cook, the, 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 uh, the, who found, he actually mapped most of Australia. He found the Wine Islands, and uh, then the wines, yeah, the, his, he, went, he, he traveled around the world three times. We're not talking that, that you go east until you get west. No, he's saying as far as the 200,000 galaxies, as far as east is from west, that's how far the sin is from you. Right? As far as the east is 200,000 galaxies, that's how far, that's what I've done with your sin. It's taken care of. It's paid for. As far as the east is from the west. They don't meet, you know. It's like somewhere else, and I don't remember where it is in Scripture, it says... You know, I, I buried your sins in the deepest part of the sea. And I don't know how deep they are. Maybe it's five miles. It's a long ways. And there's a big sign. McGee used to say there's a big sign that says no fishing right there. You can't, you can't go fishing where your sins are. Jesus has paid for your sins. That's the greatest point of love he can possibly show you. And, and, and now maybe you don't think you're a sinner. I, I know in our culture today, people have issues. My daughter says people have that person, they have some issues. Well, yeah, that's sin, right? You know, and so, you know, maybe they've got a disease. And I understand about, we know that, you know, sin is passed on from generation to generation. And so we know that that happens, right? In fact, they, found, they think there's genes, you know, like you're an alcoholic or drug addict or even uh, I've read that some places that uh, um, you can be... Um, uh, you can have a disposition toward um, being gay or being uh, homosexual. You know. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, 
but I know in my family, my father was promiscuous. He was involved in a number of, you know, and, and I think there's a certain amount of stuff that's passed along. And the reality is you, you can stop it in your generation when Jesus comes and changes your heart. That stops. You don't have to, you don't have to be, I tell my kids, you know, in our family we have lots of, see, I'm Irish, and we love whiskey, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a quarter Danish, and so we love mead, you know, the, money, the drink from mead. So, so we got lots of, we, got to have, we have literally in my generations of alcoholics. And I said, you need to be careful. We probably do have some sort of disposition toward those things. So you need to ask yourself, you know, isn't it great that God pays for our sin? My sin is done. That's what he said. As far as the east is from the west, I've placed my sin in the deepest part of the sea. No fish in there. It's all done. That's how great God is, right? The gospel message, good news. Good news for that Jesus Christ has come. And uh, we praise his name for that. So I said, uh, so, so he sees Moses, he, he says this, is, who, who, is, who am I? I'm this compassionate and loving God that loves you more than anyone, and I've forgiven your sin. Man, you know. That's great news, wonderful news. I said, yet yeah, it says, he, he, he went on to say, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. But he also says in another passage, he never holds your sin, he never holds your father's sin against you. So when you go to him and ask for forgiveness, he forgives you. He forgives your generation, he forgives you. And he won't hold your father's sins against you. Now, we may have a disposition towards some sin, but he won't do that. David just gives the same description of God. He writes, for you, Lord, are good and love to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Psalms 86, 5. I don't know how many verses it talks about God's forgiveness in Psalms. I think that would be a great study, by the way. I think there's probably hundreds. How much he forgives us, forgives our sin, right? Number two, I said, the New Testament gives clarity to the Messianic Psalms. The early church proclaimed the risen Christ, quoting the scriptures from the Psalms. And, I'm, and this, is from, this is from Acts 2. David, seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses to that fact. That's what, that's what uh, Peter said shared, you know, when he was sharing one of his first messages in Acts. We've, seen, we've seen the risen Christ. And the resurrection is so amazing, isn't it? That over 500 people saw Jesus alive. 500! You know? And of course, I always do this at funerals. Jeff knows this, right? How many of you have been to New York City? I always ask that question. How many of you have been to New York City? Tom has back there. There's some hands. There's some people. How many of you think it actually exists, New York City? How many of you think the town actually exists, right? Most of you do. Maybe there's some people that know I've never been there. I don't think it's there. One time I was flying from New Jersey somewhere, and I looked over out of the airplane. I've never been to New York City. I looked out of the airplane, and I could see the Statue of Liberty in the distance. I love to go to New York. I think it's kind of hard to go there right now. But anyway, I'd love to go there and, um, and see the Statue of Liberty. I actually see it in person. You know, go, to, go and look at it and other places. But I believe it exists, right? <laughs> but if you've ever been there, how do you know, right? Well, every night they show pictures of New York on the news, right? You think it's there, right? So the, what's the witness? So that's the resurrection, right? How do you know that he raised from the dead? Well, 500 people saw him. The disciples saw him three or four times, right? Now, you, those of you that think New York exists, those that have been there before, raise your hand. Was, it really, was there really a place there? Was it, was it real? Was there buildings? Were there cars and people? You could talk to these. See these hands? You could talk to them. It really is there. New York is there. Right? That's my point on the resurrection. These were witnesses. They saw Jesus. They touched him. Jesus said, 
Hey, put your hand on my side where they stabbed, where they speared me. Put your hand on the, in the nail pins. Thomas didn't even have to do that. He just fell down, right? He wasn't there the first night, but he was there the second night. He said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, thank goodness there's people that are going to believe about the re resurrection that haven't seen me, right? Praise the Lord. They were witnesses. 500 people is a lot of people to see the risen Christ. You know, so it wasn't something that was done in the corner. I said that uh, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Again, from, from Acts, Acts 2. The disciples reminded the leaders of Israel that the one they rejected has become the keystone. It says, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. And then he says, I love this. He says, this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And we used to sing that at camp. This is a day. This is a day that the Lord has made. You know what that day was? That was the day he was crucified on the cross. This is a day he has made. Most people believe that's a reference to Jesus at the cross. The one that they rejected has now shed his blood for us. And this is the day we rejoice in the day that he died because he paid the penalty for our sin. He shed his blood for us. Psalms 118. Right? And I was thinking about Psalms 22. It starts out, he starts out actually quoting, Psalms 22 actually quotes the very words of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? the very words of Jesus that he spoke on the cross. And a lot of people talk about that. We, you know, we talk about the terrible death that he died. They beat him. They just beat the life out of Jesus, didn't they? They beat him, and then they hung him on the cross. And we talk about the physical death that he went through, but the real separation, the real tragedy for Jesus was all of his life he was sinless. He was separated. He was never separated from his father, but on the cross. Sin separated him from God, you know. And that's why I said, oh, he cannot, he cannot fathom that separation. Jesus on the cross, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't, he didn't feel forsaken because of all the physical stuff, but because he was literally spiritually separated from the Father. He became sin for us. That's what Isaiah 53 says. Became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become that we might become the righteousness of God. What a message for us today to think about, right, as we face the cross and the resurrection. So on the back page, when the disciples, when the disciples were threatened by the elders and then released, the disciples praised God and prayed that God would enable them to speak the word of God with great boldness, right? One of the things that people talk about is, Remember, they were hiding, you know, and hiding in the upper room, hiding from the, the authorities. They, were, they thought for sure they were going to come and get them. And then now, all of a sudden, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they're boldly proclaiming Jesus, you know. He said, by no other name can you be saved besides Jesus Christ. And they boldly went into the temple. And they, and they, told, the, they, they told the Sanhedrin, they say, you know, you can tell us to stop preaching, but we're not going to stop preaching. We're going to listen to God rather than you. And they, and, they, and they did. And because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. May God fill us with the Holy Spirit. May we be bold in our preaching to other people, in our sharing, in our loving other people into the kingdom. May we be bold. Believing in the resurrection. Believing in the price that was paid by Jesus and sharing that with others. One of the key concepts of the book of Romans is righteousness. God acts, God acts are always righteous, for all God does is in harmony with his character. God is the creator and moral judge of the universe, is himself the one valid standard of what is right. I've always thought about that, you know. Well, if you're going to write up Ten Commandments, what would you put down? Ten things that you think would be right or wrong, right? Well, they'd probably be different than God. Maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe you have a different t take on it. But God is the one that wrote those. It's not my standard, you know. 
When somebody gets up and shares the word, it's not our standard. It's not our word. It's God's word. This is his standard. And we know that the Ten Commandments are just part of it because there's like 633 other laws in, in the first three or four books of the Bible, right? There's lots of other laws besides that, but it's like, well, what would you choose? But he is our standard. I said righteousness is a heart, nothing more, nothing more or less than God's essential moral, moral character. God expresses his righteousness in judging sin and in saving the believing sinner. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called for a righteousness in which the very heart of the individual mirrors the heart of God. Righteousness is not to be measured by what a person does or does not do. Righteousness is to be measured simply by whether or not a person truly is in his heart, like God. Well, I'm not there yet. I can tell you that right now. God's working on me, but my righteousness is skewed. But praise be, someday we're going to be changed. He's going to give us, you know, he promises when we come to him, and he gives us a new heart, but it's still in process. But I'm thinking, wow, the righteousness of God. Let me stop with this. Uh, with, with this um, again, my last little word. I just love this. I stole it from somebody, and uh, I, I like to do that, but I'll give him credit. I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, again, the gospel. The gospel is entirely God's. The righteousness of God is provided by God. It is a righteousness that is prepared by God. It is a righteousness that is made available by God. Therefore, the gospel is entirely God's. He offers it to everyone freely. He, he, he wants to give it to us. He says, remember, his love is so great, it's greater than 200,000 galaxies away. His love reaches to the heavens, you know, and his forgiveness reaches beyond as you can comprehend. He forgives us. That's how much his love is. And we begin to understand that a little bit. That might make a difference in how we look at things, how we respond to him how we want to love him more because he loves us so much. We love him because he first loved us immensely. Nobody loves you like Mary smiles, like God does. So somebody talks to her about that. Nobody loves you like God does this morning. You might be a parent or a grandparent. I love my grandchildren. I'd do anything for them. I'd die for them in a, in a heartbeat. But God loves them so much more. You know, he does. He loves us so much more. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just come to you today. Lord, may we appreciate who you are. May we appreciate all that you've done for us. Lord, this is all about you. This is all given, you know, you gave it all to us in your son, Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine that you would send your son, your only son, to die for us. It's just, it's just overwhelming sometimes. It's like, why, why would you do that? Because you loved us so much in our sin. While we were still sinners, you demonstrated your love to us by doing that. Lord, help us to appreciate all that you've done. Help us to praise you with all that we are in our souls and our being. And Lord, and I just, I, I just want people to think about this. If you've never asked Jesus, and, and we say different things. You've never asked Jesus into your heart. You've never identified with what Jesus did for you on the cross. Now's the time to do that. Today is the day of salvation for you. You need to make that decision. This is the day. He shed his blood for us. This is the day that he wants you to respond to him and ask you to come into his heart and love him and turn your life over to him, and surrender your will to him. This is the day. Don't, don't miss out on this, this opportunity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we just want to say thank you for all of you coming today and joining us today. May God bless you. I was reading a psalm. I can't remember which one it is. It says, may God's face, may God's radiant face turn towards you. It said it like three times. May God's radiant face turn towards you this coming week. May you experience his love. May you feel his presence in your heart and life. I want to just uh, say a shout out to all our folks out in the cars. May God bless you. May his turn his, turn his face and be radiant toward you this week. All the folks out there also. And may just, uh, as you uh, prepare your hearts for Easter, you know, uh, next week we are going to have our, our uh, congregational meeting after following the service. But uh, just think in a couple of weeks we'll be celebrating Easter. So keep that in your hearts and minds. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just ask you might go with us today. Lord, that you might be lifted up, Lord, in, in all that we think. Lord, may, may, the, may the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouth be pleasing to your in your sight this week, Lord. We thank you so much for who you are. We praise you, Lord, so much for all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.